Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. Uh, so welcome everyone to another American Iris Society webinar. And the uh, topic for tonight is how to create a new iris, AKA the story of species crosses. Species crosses are hybrids involving more than one species. Species crosses were the foundation of the other current iris class. This webinar will take a look at the effects species have made on the development of the iris classifications the progress towards new classifications and the potential for crosses in the future. And Bob Prees will be um, uh, presenting tonight's webinar. And uh, Bob, in his own words, is a frustrated botanist who gave up academia to make a living. Beyond that, however, uh, which Bob hasn't said, uh, but I will tell you that he has used his botanical knowledge and his interest in the iridaceae to create one of the greatest resources available in the horticultural world, the American Iris Society Iris Encyclopedia, AKA Iris Wiki. Bob also built the AIS Ben R. Hager, Sidney P. DuBose Memorial Online Iris Library within the pages of the Iris Encyclopedia. Bob originated and brought to fruition the International Species Symposium in St. Louis, Missouri in March of 1995. Bob has also served on the board of several sections or cooperating societies over the years, including Cigna, uh, Species Iris Group North America, uh, DIS, the Dwarf Iris Society, and a ASI, the uh, Errol Society International. He has also served as a director of the American Iris Society and on the board of the American Iris Society Foundation. So without uh, further ado, welcome, Bob, and um, go ahead with your program. Okay, thank you. Um, for the first slide here, I just wanted to point out, I tried to pick a picture of a, an iris that looked very different from most irises that you see. And this is a slide of a species named uh, Iris timofevii. Uh, it's very hard to grow, uh, but to me, it's really incredible. The architecture of its leaves and the flowers to me are, are, are quite exciting. I think it, I think of it as a piece of sculpture, sculpture more than uh, just an iris plant. Um, but anyway, I wanted to point that out and uh, try to show you that with using species, you can get to new places that you really haven't been before with irises. Uh, let's see, I'm going to do this. Well, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Okay, yeah. For some reason, my keyboard didn't want to do this. Uh, about 1992, I think it was, uh, I was the um, treasurer of, our, of Cigna. And we had just done a successful uh, uh, program where we sent Jim Waddock to China and collected irises in China. And he came back and had lots of species that got distributed among the uh, people in Cigna. And I was asked to do judges trainings on species. And I thought, you know, that sounds good. You know, it makes sense to me because every species has a lot of variation in it. And there's some, some varieties that are much more exciting as garden plants than others. Uh, and one of the problems is that I think at the time, a lot of people had the impression that a species was like one plant, that they really didn't vary very much. Uh, but most people who were more familiar with species knew that there can be an enormous amount of variability in the species. And for example, all of the Japanese irises are one species. It's almost like saying, you know, talking about dogs, all the dogs are actually one species but think of all the var variation within them. So anyway, I, you know, in preparing for trying to do one of these programs, I realized there's no point in judging species because there was no awards that were given to species. So I thought, 
you know, this isn't right. Uh, and there's certainly reason to have awards. And so I went on a campaign to try to get awards for species and for species crosses. And uh, I don't know who set up the committee, but uh, I was put in charge of a committee that included Ben Hager, Francesca Thulin, and uh, Currier McCune. And it was sort of like, I was fairly reasonably new to Iris. I think I'd only been around for about 10 years. And here were these greats that were legends in their own time that were on my committee. So it was a little intimidating, but we worked real hard to try to figure out what would be the best way to, to have uh, judging a species and species crosses. And uh, we came up with um, some ideas that we were supposed to present to the board, the American Iris Society Board of Directors. So I wound up going to the board with these ideas and we had written them out because we wanted to be very careful. One of the things that in the past had been talked about was people would say, oh, you're talking about interspecies crosses. Well, no, we were talking about interspecies crosses and a lot of other crosses. Uh, once you cross two species, if they are fertile and you can develop a new type of plant, you wanna continue it. So the hybrids, next generation and next generation and so on um, are still species crosses until at some point we create a new classification for that particular group of species. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the board, well, I, at the board meeting, something also was happening that was sort of new was the board was trying to reconcile how there could be three Worcester awards instead of just one medal for tall beardeds. And they were sort of redoing the whole award system. So it came, the motion came to the board at a very opportune time uh, because a lot of them had no idea what we were talking about, I think, uh, as far as species and species crosses getting awards. But anyway, uh, the board sort of was discussing it back and forth and was really going nowhere. And I jumped up and said, I'd like to, you know, call for the question on the present on the um, motion we presented. And Claire Barr immediately called for a vote. Of course, I was not a director and I had no call, no ability actually to call for that vote, but it happened and we got the species award and the species crosses. And I was extremely pleased. And so I sort of feel, uh, I don't, I, I, not exactly ownership, but, uh, you know, I feel like this is something I started and I'd like to see how it proceeds into the future. Now, one of the things I looked at in doing this program was I, I looked at Football Hero, which is our latest uh, Dykes medal winner. And I went back a generation and saw who the parents were. And then I went to another generation and another generation all the way back until I finally hit a species. And uh, down at the bottom of the page, you can see Iris Mesopotamica uh, was what I wound up with. This was 10 generations from Mesopotamica. Uh, we talk a lot about how many generations things are from species, but the species crosses in theory could be any number of generations, but obviously you have a classification that exists, the tall bearded irises. So you don't need to continue calling these uh, species crosses. But the idea of adding a species to get something new, I think uh, is what we're all about. Uh, Iris Mesopotamica is a tetraploid tall bearded. And of course you can see within e easily two generations, maybe three, something very different was developing by uh, crossing the species with what was out there. Now, I go back through history and all of the different classes that we have in, in the Iris Society all started with species crosses. Uh, we didn't call them species crosses at the time, 
but nonetheless, they were species crosses. And looking back, um, one of the great persons to do crosses was Sir Michael Foster. He lived in the 1836 to 1907, and he was tremendous in popularizing the irises. Uh, he himself was a physician. He was a doctor of human physiology. He was a professor and wrote the book, actually, that most of the universities used on human physiology. And two of his graduate students went on to win Nobel Prizes in human physiology. So he wasn't just your ordinary person, but somehow he found time to investigate irises and to try all sorts of different types of crosses. And in doing so, he used to publish his findings in the Gardener's Chronicles and in the Garden and in another French uh, weekly that was um, Rue Hardicot. And what amazes me is these were newspapers that came out weekly with 10 to 20 pages each week, uh, with sometimes you know, five columns of text. It was just incredible the amount of information that was coming out at this time. And uh, Foster was right at the lead of um, presenting this information to the public and really got a lot of people going on irises in his time period. Uh, there were also, it was fun because reading through these because at the time when they come out weekly, you'd have some horticulturists that would completely disagree with another horticulturist that had just published something the week before. And you got these long standing arguments that went back and forth um, from week to week. So it was a very interesting reading. Um, and if you, I had the, the privilege of reading the uh, Gardener's Chronicles at the Missouri Botanical Garden. But remember, these are newsprint and a hundred year old newsprint is really delicate. So it was very difficult to be as careful as one needed to be not to have the pages crack or have any uh, breaking of the pages. And now these are all on the Biodiversity Heritage Library. So one can go there and view them and read them without having any problem of uh, really destroying the originals. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide if it works, okay. Um, one of the things that Foster looked at was at the time, uh, almost all the tall beardeds when he first started were diploid and they were essentially pallida and variegata crosses. And a lot of other irises that were named species like squalens and lurida and amina and flavescens, they were all called species at the time, but actually he proved by his crosses and his experimental crosses that they were real, all, all really crosses between pallida and variegata. And in some ways, Foster was unique in this because in essence, he was one of the first experimental taxonomists by actually creating a theory and then testing it by crossing the plants and seeing what happened. Okay. One of the two of the types of irises or actually three of the types of irises that were prominent at this time was Al Iris albicans, Iris florentina, and Iris germanica. And there's a lot of confusion about what is actually Iris Germanica. And I'm not gonna go into a long thing about that, but the Germanica that I'm looking at here is an intermediate, not the regular tall bearded Germanica. Uh, they were both called Germanica, but all three of these species were actually natural hybrids that were triploid, which meant that they were sterile. So you couldn't get any, really any development with these. But in nature, triploids are oftentimes very uh, robust. They grow easily and can be propagated by clones, but uh, they can't produce 
uh, more types. Albicans shows like there were two colors and the color was basically due to a, a sport where one gene changed uh, occasionally and it would flip to white. Most of the time it was white, occasionally it would flip to blue and then it could flip back again. Okay. Now, there were tetraploid species that, that uh, Foster was important in getting into the trade and getting people to experiment with. One of them that he, he actually traveled to Turkey and collected the, the, uh, the plant Amas, which is a Germanica uh, from Turkey. And he found that by crossing it with the diploids, he could actually force some of the diploids to become tetraploid and that extended the possibilities of all different types of colors. And Amas, if you go back as one of the, uh, I like to call them foundation plants of the tall bearded irises. Uh, so, so was Mesopotamica and Trojana and Cypriana. Uh, they, they were all in essence, probably something close to either Germanica or species in their own right, but they were all tetraploid. Um, one of the interesting things about a moss was that it never would produce a pod, but its pollen was really um, effective and would, would cross on the, cause these other plants to cross with this when the pollen was put on them. Um, and I think that's one of the lessons I said in my lead up to this talk that I wanted to point out things that a beginning hybridizer should know. One of them is try things both ways. Uh, the parentage, uh, a, a single parent may not work one way, but it may work in the opposite direction if it's a pod parent or, or instead the pollen parent. And, and so trying different things different ways, even though you think you, you've crossed something already, uh, if you didn't try it in the other direction, you probably really weren't uh, testing its full capability. Now, so in essence, Foster's was at the beginning and the creation of the modern tall bearded irises. He also did some things like he crossed uh, Iris monieri, which was a, a spuria species, and Iris spuria, and he got a plant called he called monspur, which essentially was the first. Um, Spuria hybrid. And he, he named it Monspur and he, he created this um, convention for naming. And in his own words, he said, the name I have given the seedling follows a plan which I myself find useful. The first half is taken from the mother's name, the last, latter half from the, that of the father. Hence the name tells the parentage and the, and the ending in a consonant shows it as a hybrid. Well, he didn't follow his convention totally because uh, he also had some that he named that he didn't have the, that were hybrids that didn't end in a consonant. But uh, his, his technique or his convention for naming caught on widely. And species crosses even today uh, use this to some degree. For example, Van Tubergen crossed Iris Iberica with Iris Macrantha and created the Iris Ibmac. Um, Ibmac, you could also think of as one of the first um, arrowbreds. And Foster himself was a little earlier with another arrowbred. He crossed Paradoxa and Sambucina and got Parasina, which part of an ugly iris, but uh, it was different. Okay. Um, another one that F Fernand Denis uh, produced was Paltec, and he crossed Iris Tectorum with Edina. And for years, I thought, boy, I'd really like to repeat that cross. And I didn't realize, I, by the name, I thought it was Pallida that was crossed with Tectorum. And that wasn't right at all. Edina, at the time, 
of Foster, uh, they used the plant names of the species that were the original diploid species as colored groups. And so a dino was in the colored group pallida. But you know, there were things like uh, squalins, and we even have these color groups today. We could talk about an aminas and neglectas. These were all species names that weren't really species, they were hybrids, but they used those names to um, sort of organize the different types of, of bearded irises. And uh, that was first done by Barr in his catalog um, early in the, or late in the 1890s. Now, the botanists also have a way of doing hybrid names. And so they take um, two plants like Iris hookeriana, hookeriana and cameoensis, and uh, those two crossed and Dykes named it Iris sycamensis, but they decided later that it was actually a hybrid. Um, they didn't know at the time that he, that, but they surmised that this was the cross. So to designate a cross, they do iris and then X, and then they give it a unique name. So any iris X sycamensis means that according to its definition, uh, it has both hookeriana and cameoensis in the background. It may be either direction on the cross. It may also be the two of them crossed with themselves with an, them, a self or with one of the other later. All those are considered in the uh, botanical naming uh, of the X name. Now I like to call these the X files because a lot of botanists don't really get, pay them a whole lot of attention. Um, I looked in the um, world checklist put together by the Royal Horticultural Society and they list about 195 X names. Um, most of them, well, let's put it this way, about 50 of them were actually synonyms of some sort of Germanic across and about another 50 were synonyms of some sort of Louisiana species cross. Uh, and that's a whole nother story actually. The, another group that was created by species crosses or by a cross bringing a new species into the mix was the Dutch irises. Uh, Van Tubergen did this and he produced, he took the Spanish irises which was Iris ziphium, which were fairly tall, had small flowers, uh, and were and grew fairly late. They bloomed fairly late, and crossed them with Iris tingitana, and he wound up with a new cross, Iris exholandica, and all of the Dutch irises are Iris exholandica. They bloom earlier. They have larger flowers, uh, but they're all species crosses. And because the American Iris Society doesn't register them, uh, when I was putting together the Iris Encyclopedia, I thought, what am I going to do with these? And so essentially, they're all in the species cross section classification, uh, even though they're not really registered by the American Iris Society. Now, other types of crosses. Uh, nature does this all the time, or at least frequently enough that new species are created. And one of the species that was created by two other species crossing was Iris versicolor. The, there's a blue iris called Iris setosa that grows all across Canada, really into the uh, Lucian Islands, Alaska, and actually over into uh, Russia. And setosa actually could be a couple different species. Uh, nobody's really pursued this very strongly, but one of the, the, the uh, characteristics of Sedosa is they don't have any standards. The standards are nothing but bristles, which is what Sedosa means. 
and there's these little tiny bristles that stick up. You can't even see them in the picture. Uh, but that plant crossed with Iris virginica, which is the southern blue iris, and which grows in the south, southeastern United States. And the, the cross created Iris versicolor. And Iris versicolor grows well in the northern part of the eastern United States and into Canada. Uh, the person who figured this out was Edgar Anderson, and he did it by just really looking at hundreds and hundreds of plants and figuring out that there was uh, relationships and by measuring, making careful measurements and everything, he proved pretty much beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is what happened, that nature performed this cross and created Iris versicolor. He also showed that um, Iris uh, versicolor and Iris virginica crossed would produce another hybrid called Iris X robusta. And X robusta has the characteristic of always having purple foliage at the base and sometimes all the way up into the, um, the pods. Um, X robusta, there's a lot of X robusta cultivars that have been named through the years, uh, all with the different characteristics of this purple coloring. And I've seen pictures that were really quite striking. The purple coloring shows up in colder weather better. So places like Germany, where in certain areas of Germany, it stays cold for a long period in the spring, the entire plant would be a really dark purple, which was quite, quite striking. So a natural species cross, or you can do it today even, uh, will produce Iris robusta. Bob, before you uh, go on, can I uh, ask a question uh, related sure. to that cross? Uh, Gene Richter asks, uh, is it known how this natural cross came about given drastically different ranges and bloom times for Setosa and Virginica? Well, probably at one time, Virginica extended further north and probably Setosa extended further now south. And really, I think the logic or the belief was that during the glaciations, uh, Setosa was pushed further south. Virginica didn't have any place to go. So it sort of stayed in place. And so the two met and created Virgin uh, Versicolor. And then uh, as the glaciers receded, Versicolor filled in behind Setosa. Um, making sort of a, a, a band between Virginica and Setosa. Okay, and we have a question also from Chuck Chapman. Yeah. It's not a question, uh, more of an observation. Okay. Um, I have a Robusta, which I registered and collected, and uh, it came from the uh, southern part of, of Ontario. And actually in the southern part of Ontario, Virginica and Versicolor do overlap. And uh, because there's, there's some Virginica, which is sort of farther south and certainly some Versicolor you know, in the same range. But uh, Tony Huber did a, a survey and found populations of Robusta all across Canada or all across Ontario and Quebec in different isolated populations. And from far as I'm concerned, because Robusta produces Robusta from seed, true to type, that this is basically a new species which will eventually be recognized as being a new species because it has a, a high distribution, has a, a, you know, a lot of populations, and certainly where in locations where it is, it outcompetes both Virginica and Versicolor. Yeah, I, I have no argument with that. In fact, uh, generally, I, as having been trained as a taxonomist, I know that for every, it's sort of like the old saying, if you put three law, two lawyers in a room, you'll get three opinions. Uh, it's same with taxonomists. Uh, hardly anybody really is total in, a, in total agreement about anything most of the time, but uh, uh, some people will favor a more, uh, uh, how should I put it, narrow definition of, the, of species and others will define it more broadly. 
Um, and I, I like the narrow definitions just because they tend to record the differences and the variation. Whereas the people who broadly define something just ignore all the variation that occurs within those species, or they just you know put it as a footnote. Whereas for a gardener, uh, a lot of those variations are make really good garden plants uh, and are quite different from the average uh, species that uh, you may encounter. Uh, so um, to me, varieties and uh, giving names to uh, species in a narrow sense makes a lot of sense to me just because it tells us what we have. In fact, uh, one of the things that uh, Tony also, you talked about Tony Huber, and um, he also collected uh, Iris canadensis, which is also sometimes called Setosa. Uh, and it grows on the cliffs on the edge of the uh, sea in Maine and uh, on the coast. And one of the interesting things about it is it's probably a, 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 a species, a, excuse me, a hybrid itself. It's a very dwarf plant. Uh, but one of the reasons why I say that, if you grow it, the, even though it has the bristle-like standards, every now and then a flower will, one of those bristles will develop into a full standard. And so to me, that indicates it's sort of genetically uh, not as stable as one would think, and that possibly it's really a hybrid. Um, but it's a very, it's an interesting plant in itself. So another question, Bob, is canadensis the same as Iris hookeri? Yes. Yes. Yeah. The, the name's gone back and forth as to, um, well, whether you're a, a lumper or splitter or whatever. Uh, but yeah, that's the same plant, which don't confuse with Hookeriana, <laughs> which yeah. is close on the name. Um, okay, let, let's go to okay. Fitz Randolph. And he also showed how species can be created by two species crossing with each other in nature. And he found that Iris attica, which is a little dwarf, diploid dwarf, and our Pseudopumula, which is a little diploid dwarf, crossed and created the tetraploid Iris pumula. And he did that by looking at, you know, it's incredible to me what these people were able to do with limited technology. But by looking through a microscope that probably only had about 900 power at best uh, with oil immersion, and staining the chromosomes as they were dividing by looking at tons and tons of cells dividing, they could count the chromosomes and sort of get little pictures drawn of each of the different types of chromosomes. And they could see there were eight chromosomes in Attica and eight in Pseudopumula that were different. And in, in Pumula, uh, there were double even though the, the eight weren't exactly the same in the two different species, when you put them together in Pumula, they uh, created a tetraploid effect and you could still distinguish the um, pseudopumula and Attica chromosomes. So anyway, um, Randolph, he was one of the presidents of the American Iris Society. And during his term uh, in the fifties, people were counting chromosomes and he went across overseas and brought back lots of different iris species, uh, especially bearded species that people were then using to cross with and create new species crosses. And because of his work, and also there was another person that gets, goes back a little bit before Randolph, in 1929, Amos Perry was a gardener who was trying all sorts of crosses. And he was the first one to make a cross between a um, Pacific Coast native and the Sino-Siberian. He named it Margot Holmes. And the British Iris Society was so impressed that they awarded the first Dykes Medal to Margot Holmes, 
a species cross by Amos Perry. Um, the, the parents are shown at the bottom and uh, you can see there's quite a bit of difference between the, the, the three plants. Uh, Amos Perry was an incredible horticulturalist and produced tons of different types of plants. If you go through any uh, perennial guide, you'll find Perry's poppies and Perry's delphiniums and Perry's this and Perry's that. And he produced lots of, of um, iris crosses and was one of the first that really did much with um, Pacific Coast natives. But sadly, he was, this was like in 1929 and we had the depression and then the war came along and his fields and stuff during the war were plowed under so that a lot of his plants just disappeared and totally. Um, so it's sort of a tragic story in a sense, but Amos Perry is still, in my mind, one of the most important uh, iris breeders of all time. And because of that, that's why we named the metal the Randolph Perry Medal for species crosses because of Perry, because of Randolph proving that species could be developed naturally. And for that matter, Anderson probably could have been in uh, Randolph's place, but Randolph actually did more. Uh, so we have the Randolph Perry Medal and not the Anderson Perry Medal. But Edgar Anderson was a much beloved botanist at Missouri Botanical Gardens. Now, it's another, it's another question here, Bob. Sure. Uh, can genetic science DNA mapping help differentiate different species and, inter, and interspecies or species crosses? I'm sure it can. I'm not sure it has yet. Uh, I, I think of Ancestry.com and thinking, wouldn't it be cool if you could just plug in your iris's DNA and, and find out you know, as much as possible. But even uh, Carol Wilson's, who's works with uh, DNA and uh, the, the genomes of irises, she's only working with segments of the genome because the entire number of, of genes and so forth is so enormous that uh, to compare things right now is just beyond the scope of the modern computers, even with our supercomputers today. So there's a ways to go, but I'm sure we'll get there. Um, now, let's go to another famous species cross. This was by Paul Cook. And Paul Cook was really one of the AIS's premier um, hybridizers back in the 50s. And he, he wound up winning two, um, di three Dykes medals. Uh, but he would try unusual things. And remember, Randolph was bringing back all these unusual species and Reichenbachia was one of them. Iris Reichenbachia was crossed with Shining Waters by Paul Cook and he got Iris progenitor, which at the time didn't look like much, but one of the lessons in species crosses is you don't stop at one generation. And progenitor wound up producing the whole cloth line of tall bearded irises, which were dominant aminas. And at the time, aminas were hard to come by because uh, they were uh, recessive and you couldn't really do much in changing colors and stuff. But when he introduced the whole cloth line, then uh, we could get aminas with other colors besides just blue and white. And Emma Cook was uh, his um, uh, um, I'm trying to remember which came first, whether it was Emma Cook or Cole Cloth. But anyway, these were the were two of the irises that came out of the line of progenitor. So never assume that by looking at the something like Iris Reichenbachii that you would realize that it had a dominant amina gene. Um, it's not until you actually do the cross that you find out what you actually can wind up with. Now, one of the most famous 
in, in essence, species crosses. And in a way, one of the most successful for the American Iris Society was the cross of Iris pumulus with tall beardeds that produced the standard dwarfs. And Paul Cook, again, was um, important in that, and Geddes Douglas. And the story goes that um, I believe they were both postmasters or po postmen, and they would exchange pollen, pollen by mail so that when Geddes Douglas had tall beardeds blooming in Kentucky and Paul Cook had uh, pumulas blooming in Indiana, he could send the pumula pollen to, to Geddes Douglas and they would do a, the cross, he would do the crosses and get the uh, pumula crosses. And because of their work in initiating that group of viruses, that's why the Cook Douglas medal is named after, that's for standard dwarfs is named after them. And of course we didn't have species crosses at the time, that, that classification. The first uh, Cook Pumula hybrids, wait a minute, I think I missed a slide. Yeah, um, one of the reasons why Pumula hadn't been used before this was that we didn't, most people think we didn't actually have Iris Pumula in the United States. And that Robert Schreiner was the first one to import seed from the University of Kluge in 1942. And these are three of the cultivars that he um, grew out of that seed and were used later for crossing with uh, tall beardeds. Now, unfortunately, um, it wasn't these particular pumulas that uh, Geddes Douglas and, and uh, Paul Cook used, but, uh, but the, they were, these were the first pumulas and that sort of uh, created the possibility of new ones coming into the country. So Beria and Fairy Flax and Greenspot were all pumulas crossed with, unfortunately, a Paul Cook seedling that we have no pictures of. So nobody knows what the, the tall bearded looked like. But Geddes Douglas crossed pumula with a number of named tall beardeds. And um, for example, Minnie Colcott with a violet pumula produced garnet treasure and orange glow with a yellow pumula produced rosy wings. Now think about all the standard dwarfs that are out there. And these particular standard dwarfs are probably not all that exceptional today, but look at what they were crossed with as far as tall beardeds go. I think there's an opportunity today to cross with modern tall beardeds, Iris pumula, and get standard dwarfs that are very different from a lot of the standard dwarfs that are even available now. This is not a new idea. Um, and uh, over time, there's been over a hundred crosses between pumula and tall bearded irises, different tall bearded irises, but there's still room for something new to happen. Now, going back to Geddes Douglas's um, crosses, Lilliput was one of the first ones he, he got, and Happy Thoughts, and Lily Pink Putt, and Pogo, and Tinkerbell. And you notice they're all 10 to 15 inches tall, uh, which is just right for standard dwarfs. None of these were registered as standard dwarfs, because at the time, we didn't have the registration. They were all registered as IBs, which probably would surprise a lot of people. And strangely enough, it went on to the point that uh, Lily Pink Putt actually won the SAS award and then later the SAS medal for the best IB. But now we would consider them standard dwarfs. Now, the standard dwarfs and the miniature dwarfs um, up until 1953, all dwarfs were just dwarfs and there were anything under 15 inches tall. So the idea of standard dwarfs and miniature dwarfs um, really took a while to develop. And some people wanted miniature dwarfs to be 10 inches tall uh, and standard dwarfs above 10 inches. 
and other people wanted them to be eight inches tall. And it went back and forth and back and forth for 25 years. And finally, it was settled when the United, by an act of Congress. The United States went to the Metric Conversion Act of 1975, and it declared that the metric system was the preferred system of weights and measures for the United States. So the Irish Society complied by using, if you notice on the right, the centimeters make sense for the different classes, but the inches don't particularly make sense when you translate it over to inches on the left. So this is how we got, it's very arbitrary, but this is how we got the size dimensions for the different classes of the um, bearded irises. Any questions? No, not at the moment. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of other directions that, you know, has since been pretty much considered species crosses because of the fact that they don't fit in anything else. Uh, sometime back in 1971, Don Patton noticed Holden Clough, uh, well, this iris in his garden, and he named it Holden Clough. Uh, nobody knows exactly how that should be pronounced, by the way. Uh, some people pronounce it Holden Clo, some people pronounce it Holden Clough, and it's um, Welsh. And apparently, the Welsh, the uh, Clough family, pronounces it something like Fluff. So I have no idea. Nobody really caught on to that. So I think Holden Clo or Holden Clough is what you'll hear mostly. Everybody was amazed at this iris. They couldn't figure out where it came from. And he had Pseudochorus growing in his garden. And pretty much everybody thought, well, it, it looks like a Pseudochorus cross, but what could possibly be crossed with it? And it turned out that it, it took uh, 1988, let's see, that's 17 years before a offspring of Holden Clough actually turned out to look like a, a versicolor. So probably Versicolor and um, Pseudochorus were the origin of Holden Clough. Now the, the uh, Holden Clough line produced some really interesting plants. First of all, the plants, Holden Clough hardly ever produced seed. So it was really remarkable that in one year, around 1987, in three different, in two different gardens, um, Thomas Tomberg's garden in Germany and uh, Ben Hager's garden in uh, California, both, both produced some seeds from Holden Clough. And when they planted them and grew them on, this is what they got, Berlin Tiger, Roy Davidson, and Phil Ettinger. And, and one of the um, interesting asides was Roy Davidson came out just a little bit too late or too early to be included into the new classification of species crosses. It didn't exist at the time. And Roy and uh, Ben Hager had the reputation at the time of he had won the, the main medal for every different class of irises. And then when the species cross award and medal came about, he didn't have, he didn't, he didn't win that award, and he probably should have had won it with Roy Davidson, but fortunately he had another plant in the garden, Phil Ettinger, that he put forward a little later, and it did win the uh, award. So Ben Hager still why wound up winning all of the hybrid classification awards. Now. Um, Berlin Tiger and uh, a pointer was an uh, offspring of Berlin Tiger, supposedly with Mysterious uh, Monique as one of the um, parents. Mysterious Monique, I suspect, you know, although it was registered as a versicolor, I'm pretty sure it wasn't a pure versicolor, that it was actually a hybrid. But Mysterious Monique was an incredibly beautiful iris. Uh, now the Pseudochorus, when crossed with the Japanese irises, produced something very different again. 
there were crosses that were made very early uh, by Osuga and Yuiki in Japan. And uh, they were available and they were pretty much considered like Japanese irises, but they were really different. One of the characteristics that they had was they produced foliage that was yellow. And I had a friend who grew these irises and he was so distressed by the fact that in his row of green iris foliage, he had these yellow foliage plants uh, that he worked terribly hard to provide them with um, um, iron supplement and all sorts of things spraying on the foliage until he finally got them to turn green. But, you know, I thought to myself, why are you doing that? I don't think people appreciate, why do we grow hosta that are yellow? You know, we grow them for their leaves. And these two irises not only had pretty flowers, but they had wonderful yellow foliage, especially in the spring. But I think that for some reason, irisarians didn't really catch on to that. Um, Chance Beauty was another Pseudochorus um, cross and uh, Pixie Wan uh, with um, Iris and Sada, the Japanese Iris. Uh, John Ellis and Jill Copeland, I think should be uh, given a special honor for thinking ahead and doing something really uh, exciting. And they, they produced two really wonderful plants. Now later, uh, there was a, a pseudochorus that was believed to be a pseudochorus called Gubigen. And for some reason, when it was crossed with Pseudocor with uh, Ansada, it produced some really wonderful hybrids that Shimizu was able to introduce. And nobody could quite figure out why this Pseudochorus was doing, was even compatible with this, the Ansadas. But it turned out later that um, one of its offspring turned out to be unexpected surprise, which sort of gives us a hint that maybe it wasn't a pure Pseudochorus. Uh, now, I mentioned the Shimizu Sudatas, and I think they're really marvelous plants. They're almost, almost totally sterile. Uh, most of them have yellow foliage in the spring. I understand that in the Pacific Northwest, they really don't grow that well. They're a little hard to grow because of the yellow foliage. And... Um, so they're, they're not as vigorous in some ways, but they're pretty vigorous in the garden, not quite as vigorous as a pseudochorus, but they have some wonderful combinations of color. And I mentioned before that um, in the um, references in the encyclopedia, uh, there's about 60 different uh, ones that I have in a gallery that you can take a look at. Now, part of the problem is this, these are still dead ends. Um, so Tomberg has been treating them with um, his um, colchicine and getting fertile tetraploid pseudochorus. And uh, this is what his, some of his results that were shown on his website. I don't think any of these have been named yet, um, but they give you an idea of what a tetraploid um, sudata might look like. And it gives a possibility for other types of crosses where you might cross one of these sudatas with something else that's tetraploid. Uh, like what about a tetraploid calcibe or Sino-Siberian? It opens up a huge uh, set of possibilities. Now, one of my uh, favorite hybridizers was Tony Huber. And I don't wish I had a better picture of him, but Tony was really the champion of versicolors. Um, not only did he like growing the versicolors and collected them all over Canada, but he did extensive hybridizing with them. And he was so proud of the versicolors that were native to Canada that he convinced the uh, Quebec legislature to name the 
Iris versicolor as the uh, province uh, national plant, or I don't know what you call it. Uh, but anyway, it's the, the plant of the Quebec, Quebec flag, even though it's a, you see a um, fleur de lis behind, it was actually named Ar the Iris versicolor. One of the other bits of work that Tony did was he was a professional hybridizer working for W.H. Perone Company in Canada. And he produced the gold mound cyber, uh, spireas that were all over in landscaping in the, um, I guess in the 1970s, roughly. So Tony did a lot of really good work. Um, oh, and I should mention, Enfant Prodigy was one of my favorites of his. And one of the reasons why is because it bloomed continuously. Um, it was in bloom easily for three months of the year. Um, so I think that that's something remarkable. And Chuck Chapman was telling me about his Eternal Summer, which actually does the same thing, which is a bearded iris from a phyllo crossing. Uh, these are some of the hybrids of Tony. Um, he did um, Versicolors and also these, I, I can't remember now if these are all uh, with the Ansata crossing, but uh, you can check back. I think these might be the Ansata crosses, but a lot of really beautiful irises that he produced. And he produced a lot of them that I don't have pictures of. So um, if anybody goes through the gallery, they'll see a number of uh, references to plants that don't have pictures. And if anybody has pictures of those, I'd love to get them filled in on the encyclopedia. Now, Thomas Tomberg I've mentioned before, and he's really an incredible person. He's a chemical engineer. He's been doing uh, colchicine uh, creation of uh, tetraploids for some time. And this is sort of a list of the different types of irises that he's worked with. He uses the convention a lot that's, that uh, um, Foster was using with calcibes, but he doesn't use it in the same way, which can be a little confusing. For example, uh, if we take Crusada here and notice this is series chrysographies that he uses, which is the Sino-Siberians and series, oops, I've misspelled it. It should be E-N-S-A-T-A-E. Iris lactea, which was series in Sadi, which makes it really confusing because in Sada originally was what created the series name, but then it was discovered that it had been named um, earlier that the uh, name in Iris and Sada name had been used earlier for the Japanese Iris. So they then had to convert the name to Iris lactea uh, for, the, for this strange little uh, Chinese Iris. So these are not the Japanese Irises in this group crossed with these, but further down in some of the others, he actually does use, um, Chris, well, like Chris Somatica is, um, Iris chrysography is used with the, the species name Iris prismatica and not something like the series name. So um, it could be a little confusing, but he, these are some of the wonderful types of hybrids that he's produced. And I'll show you a few later. But one I wanted to call your attention to is this Iris lactea. The reason why I call your attention to it is if you think about it, the Pacific Coast natives are really hard to grow. The Sino-Siberians are hard to grow. But this little plant is like, you can run over it with a truck and it'll still come up and, and grow. In fact, uh, people, it grows all across China and people report that it's growing in the middle of roadways a lot of times where carts are running over it daily. Um, one of the species that's been named was redundant, 
uh, named by um, Sh Schaefer Sachs. And this species has a number of variations that I don't think have been taken advantage of. Um, this iris uh, Lactea and Lactea grandiflora, you can see a herbarium specimen with those two on it. Grandiflora is huge compared to the normal iris Lactea. It's not in commerce that I know, but uh, Tamberg has been using it in his crosses. And uh, so they're not just the normal Lactea that's in the crosses. Also, the, the iris like redu redundant um, has a different habit than the normal Lactea. It tends to come up and bloom above the foliage very short. Um, and so it, it's really quite a nice iris, whereas Iris chinensis, uh, Iris insata, variety chinensis, it tends to bloom down in the foliage. So here you have this iris that's indestructible. And if you could only add that indestructibility to some of the modern hybrids, and that's what Tomberg has been trying to do. Um, his Crusada hybrids here show you some of the results. And granted, they're not all that beautiful compared to others of his other of his, but hopefully they pr they actually pass on some of this um, vigor that is in uh, Iris Lactea. And this is another generation of it. And then he's converted them to tetraploids. And this is um, some of the tetraploid seedlings that he's gotten. And now these could be crossed with any other tetraploid and get fertile hybrids. And maybe in their gene pool, they could pass on some of that hardiness that is lacking in the Sino-Siberians and in the Calcibes. Okay, and, and here's a, a Sino-Siberian crossed with a Crisada. Um, so it's only one quarter Lactea, but these are beginning to look pretty nice. I have no idea how tough they are, but uh, the potential is there. So I think that's an exciting avenue for us to go down. Bob, I have yeah. a, a question uh, yeah. from Carol Morgan. Where did Thomas Tamberg and Tony Huber grow their species? Okay, Tony Huber lived in Montreal and Thomas Tomberg lives in Germany and I can't tell you what part, but I'm pretty sure it's probably one of the colder parts of Germany uh, that probably has long cold springs because he's able to grow the Sino-Siberians and the uh, Pacific Coast natives, it seems relatively easily. So he's been able to make a lot of these crosses. Okay. Okay. Um, calcibes. To me, calcibes were like the ultimate species cross. And when we created the species cross category, these were one of the groups that I really had in mind uh, because they didn't fit with the, the Pacific Coast natives. They didn't fit with the Sino-Siberians. They were something unique, but they were the cross between the two. And the early ones were not a whole lot to write home about, but when you get down here to Half Magic in 1983, um, they're beginning to look pretty nice. And then we go to more that were developed, uh, Gene Witt and uh, a number of hybridizers in the United States produced one or two plants. Uh, they were always hard to, to grow and to produce, but uh, these were calcibes. And then Lorena Reed did uh, at least three, uh, at least six here. And she may have done more, I can't remember now, but I've got a calcide gallery uh, on the encyclopedia for your reference uh, that gives you all of them. Okay. And these are Thomas Tomberg's when you start going to tetraploid calcibes. To me, this is, well, the, actually these are not tetraploid calcibes. These were diploids that he created. And you can see the incredible color combinations 
and so forth. And these were uh, tetraploid calcides. So to me, they're really fantastic new types of plants. Uh, this one down here looks very much like the Sino-Siberian species uh, Clarkii, which has this sort of butterfly wing pattern on it. Um, but the, the Pacific Coast nat natives and the Sino-Siberians are both contributing lots of interesting color combinations to these plants. And Dave Neiswanger uh, was able to get tetraploid calcibes from Tamburg and do his own crosses. And he produced Berlin Cape Connection, which um, a lot of stuff from Tomberg is labeled Berlin. So maybe maybe Berlin is close to his nursery. I don't know. Um, yeah, Andy, Andy Riverola says Thomas Tomberg is near Berlin in Germany. Yeah. So um, if that gives you an idea of where he would be located. And these are these are um, Dave Neiswanger's introductions. And Dave grew these in um, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. So they can be grown in the harsher parts of the United States. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of possibility here. I'm not sure people, too many people have been working with them, especially in the United States anymore. Uh, this, these are um, tetraploid calcibes that uh, Jean-Claude uh, Jacob uh, produced using uh, Tomberg uh, calcibes. And to me, they're, you know, all of these are really interesting new plants uh, that look like they could be great garden plants. Now, other species. Uh, Tomberg crossed Ruthenica with uh, the, the Sino-Siberians and got Crythenica. And he crossed Iris Prismatica with uh, the Sino-Siberians and got Chrismaticas. Uh, one of the things about, well, let me tell you a little bit. Iris Ruthenica, sort of the Russian iris, is a real short little dwarf. It's really cute, has large flowers. Um, I'm not sure what Chrythenica looks like, but I think this is a nice, interesting new uh, combination and probably more people should be trying it with other species. And Prismatica grows on the East Coast in swampy areas around New Jersey. Uh, the thing that interested me most about Prismatica was its stems are like little fine wires. So they're almost invisible when you see it in the garden and the flowers seem to float in midair. So I think it has, it's a quite charming uh, little iris and has some potentials. I always look at what does the species bring to the crosses and can you develop that um, into interesting garden plants. Now, let's go to a different group of irises. And uh, this is probably one of the oldest known irises. Linnaeus described uh, the ir iris dichotoma, the Vesper iris. And he also described Bellum canda uh, which he didn't call an iris, but uh, since then, uh, recently, they've changed it to an iris. These are both really interesting species. One of the properties of them is notice the dying flower. This doesn't show it real well, but it curls up into a corkscrew that is really tight and really a lot of cur turns to it, and then it falls off. So they're self-cleaning irises, which is nice because each plant can produce uh, stalks with so many branches that they may have over 150 flowers on a single plant um, to give you a perspective. So there's, there's something really interesting about these two plants. And for years, um, Sam Norris tried to cross them and couldn't get anywhere. And other people tried to cross them and nothing seemed to happen. Uh, Rex Pierce, took the bellum candas and he found a bellum canda called iris bellum canda flabellata that now the botanist reduced to just a synonym 
but it used to be having a separate name. And it was a little tiny dwarf yellow iris. And by crossing that with the larger um, regular chinensis form of Bellum canda, he produced something like freckle face and hello yellow. And these were called the Avalon hybrids. And they were hybrids of Bellum canda, which is now Iris domestica. So they actually were species crosses. I mean, excuse me, species, not species crosses. But um, Sam Norris got a hold of Iris dichotoma by way of uh, a plant that was brought by brought back from Siberia from the town of Shilka. And this is what it looked like. And this plant was widely touted in the um, uh, garden catalogs for a number of years. And this is the picture that they generally used. But I went back to Hansen's original catalog and it turns out that Shilka was actually a novelty. It produced multiple flower petals and different arrangements and so forth and produced hundreds of different flowers. So it wasn't your normal Vesper iris. And one of the things I have decided that happens a lot with crossing is you need plants that have something odd about them. Remember Gubigen wasn't quite the normal uh, Pseudochorus. Well, Shilka wasn't quite the normal um, uh, Vesper iris. And the Avalon hybrids weren't your quite normal um, Bellum candas. But Sam Norris was able to cross Shilka with the Avalon hybrids. And this, these are what he got. And they were uh, actually introduced by Park Seed Company as the candy lilies. Um, I'm not sure Sam ever got very much out of that, uh, but I guess we don't know the details. But this is a picture of Sam. I couldn't get a, a, a really great picture of him, but this is a great picture in the sense that Sam Norris is here with Daryl Propes, who is his protege and has been doing crosses with the, um, what are now called Iris norisii, ex norisii um, today. So in honor of Sam Norris, we have Iris ex norisii. And there were, I, I'm not sure why Sam could never get hybrids from other dichotomas, but the, the Shilkos seemed to turn the, the, make it different and give him a chance to do it. Harlan Hammernick also went to um, Mongolia and collected uh, Iris dichotoma and Bellum canda. And he produced a series of dwarfs that I really liked. Uh, the Dazzler hybrid series and Sangria. Then there was the Jungle uh, Colors. And he had a whole bunch of different ones. And now they were, they were introduced by Bluestone Nursery, Bluebird Nurseries in Nebraska. Unfortunately, Harlan died a few years ago in a tragic accident where his kitchen stove blew up and killed him. Um, but Harlan really went out there and collected species and brought them back and, and experimented with them. And uh, these again will still be considered Iris ex norisii because they involve the Iris domestica and the Iris uh, dichotoma. There's another group of uh, hybrids that Gilletta Seed offers. And they also offer, by the way, uh, Dazzler series and, and uh, Sangria. Um, but I don't know where the Gilletto, the uh, Kiba giants came from. I haven't been able to find much out about them. But remember I said, you know, freckle face and hello yellow were probably about, um, I'd say eight to 10 inches tall most of the time. They could grow up to a foot and a half or more uh, under ideal conditions. So saying what the actual size is for them was, is difficult. The Kiba Giants intrigues me because I have no idea how big they were. But most of these Norisii hybrids, 
the candy lilies and so forth had flowers that are about an inch to two inches in size. I could swear when I came down here to North Carolina that I saw an Iris norisii growing in a garden that had three inch flowers. And maybe that was a Kiba giants. And in talking with Daryl Probst, I found out that there's actually a Iris domestica growing in a greenhouse down in um, Texas someplace that's eight feet tall. So the potential for creating a lot of different types of irises from these two plants is enormous. Daryl concentrated on trying to get um, Iris norisii that looked like an iris. So he really wanted the uh, style arms to stand out like irises do more than they do on the vellum candis, where they're sort of pulled together and look like one unit, just a stalk sticking up in the middle of the flower. But he wanted something that looked like irises. And these are some of Daryl Probst's hybrids. Um, most of them have been offered by Mil uh, Jan Sachs and Marty Schaefer. Um, again, and Jan Sachs and Marty Schaefer had done some of their own hybridizing. And I'm looking forward to trying to grow some of these in my garden too. But remember these came from China and the Chinese have also bred Iris norisii. And unfortunately, as far as I know, we don't have any of their, their irises in this country but this is a series of Iris norisii that they registered in 2014. So I loved the picture. I loved the irises, the, the colors and everything were just incredible. And there's probably another time or two number of these in the galleries that I have on the encyclopedia. And I, I didn't put the names on because I wanted you to enjoy the flowers at first, but these are the hybridizers. Uh, Wen Zhu, I, I probably am not going to pronounce these because I don't want to slaughter their names, but these are the hybridizers that did the 2014, and they're still introducing new um, or registering new Iris norisii. Hopefully we can get some into this country. Now I said I would tell people about some possibilities that I thought were really exciting things that nobody's done. One of them is Iris imbricata. If you look at it, it has these huge spaths and they talk about in its description as of being inflated bracts and they go up and down the stem and they're quite large and it's really sort of an ugly iris if you look at it there, but in the wild, these flowers can be bright sulfur yellow. And if you can imagine that, that's pretty neat. But then you add to it the fact that these bracts can also be bright sulfur yellow. So if you can imagine this stalk from one of the, the varieties in the wild that has the yellow bracts and yellow flowers, this whole stalk would be a mass of yellow. Um, I think we have, that's something we ought to try to bring into cultivation and cross it with tall brooded irises. Another uh, species that has interesting bracts is Iris purio bracteata, which in its name says it has purple bracts. And they are, they're not all that exciting. I know they look better in cold climates than they do in warm climates because purple coloring seems to be a, accentuated. But imagine if you could cross this with this. And for that matter, if you study iris as much, you'll find a lot of species that are yellow also have purple uh, flowers. And those, those that have purple flowers also have yellow flowers. Uh, there's a possibility you could get a torch of purple also, or maybe a torch with purple flowers and yellow bracts or vice versa. So to me, that could be an exciting possibility for the future. Another possibility, um, Iris gramineas, little shark dwarf. 
and it has really pretty flowers. It has a grape scent. Uh, it can be just covered with flowers when it's grown with enough sun. Uh, unfortunately, all the directions tell you that it can only be grown in shade, but actually it can take quite a bit of sun and it blooms much better there. But Edith Cleves, I'm thinking probably in the 1970s or so, reported in Cigna that she was able to cross Iris fetidissima that has these pods that have beautiful red berries inside and Iris graminea. And she wound up with plants that had the graminea flowers and the pods of Iris fetidissima. Fetidissima itself has sort of a icky flower, uh, but you know, if you cross this with this, you might actually get even better looking fetidissima flowers. So the possibility there of creating some dwarfs with um, fetidissima pods during the fall. And if you think about it, Graminea is part of the, and fetidissima is part of the spuria group. I'm not sure with enough effort you couldn't get the fetidissima pods into the spurias that would give you another season of color on spuria hybrids. Okay. I ran across this name in the um, in the um, list of X names, and it just goes to show I have no access to this particular uh, paper, but Graminea and growing with Siberica, that could probably produce a lot of interesting things, especially in the way of dwarf, really dwarf uh, Sibericas. Okay, another group that I really like is the Evansias. And I think we've sort of ignored the Evansias to a large degree. I'm trying to make sure I haven't skipped it. Okay. Um, Iris tectorum, I really like the white form and I love the way the petals are architecturally uh, spaced out on these long stems. Probably a lot of people think, ick, you know, they should have wide halves. But to me, it makes a much more Architectural, architecturally beautiful flower. Tectorum, Iris japonica, which will grow here in the south as a ground cover, uh, zone eight and, and warmer. And Iris confusa, which probably is more of a greenhouse plant. But look at the amount of flowers that confusa can produce. And it has these, all of these tend to have what's called fimbriate flower edges. And a lot of times their um, style arms are very fimbriate. In other words, with little um, projections growing out all over them, and sort of like lace. Um, all these are possibilities that could be hybridized together. And Fairyland was one that was Iris Japonica and Confusa by Gene Stevens back in 1936. Garidolin produced Nada, which I always wanted to call Nada, but I found out that it was named after his wife and she called herself Nada. So I've been pronouncing it wrong for many years, um, but Nada was one of the Garidalian hybrids. And uh, Darjeeling was another. And um, Mrs. Um, I'm not sure whether, oh God, my mind's going, uh, Revy, Harvey um, produced a number of hybrids also in New Zealand. And we don't have pictures of a lot of those, but this is one that sort of honors uh, some of the Evansia hybrids. It's a shame that we're not doing anything with these now. This is Iris wadii, and it's the giant in the group. And Iris wadii can, has been reported in some of the botanical literature as being as big as eight feet tall. So you can imagine what an impressive clump this could be. And the flowers are really pretty nice. And of course, all of these produce so many buds and they open for a, a day or two on the Avancias. They can have you know 50 or more flowers in bloom at the same time. This is Queen's Grace, which was a cross between Wadii and Tectorum. And everybody can grow Tectorum really easily. 
So it's a possibility this might be growable um, somewhat easier for people further north. Uh, I don't know how far it's been tried in the United States, but this is still 1955. Why hasn't anybody done more? And this is something that just came out. This is believed to be an Aris Tectorum and Aris Wadii. It was registered as Ming treasure. And uh, these leaves are really quite large. This picture is probably about five feet tall, but I saw pictures that Jim Waddick had of the leaves without the flower stems on them with a, a Chinese woman standing next to them. And she was probably at least at a minimum of five foot and the leaves were taller than she was. So this is a new hybrid. So far, it's been sterile. But you know, if we can do something with uh, tetraploid, uh, creating a tetraploid out of it, uh, maybe with uh, some tissue culture and, and uh, maybe we could get a series of tetraploid hybrids that could be quite interesting. Now, the next in group, I think, is the uh, series Chinensis. And Minuto aurea is one of them. It's a really tiny little iris. This is a pot that's probably six inches across. So it's a really cute iris. And, and everybody knows probably by now that I love really tiny things. Uh, but this, there's been a number of new irises discovered in the Chinensis series. Uh, Iris odiensis is one of them. This is a picture of odiensis. It's larger. Iris rossii has been around for some time. And Iris coriana uh, also is somewhat larger and, and is fairly new in the horticulture. But there's a published paper that all of these wind up hybridizing with each other. So there's no excuse for somebody to get out there start growing these and start hybridizing with them. And as luck would have it, there's also been two more new species added, Iris um, debashansis. By the way, ensis means in the vicinity of. So this must be like Mount Dabashan or something like that, that it's in the vicinity of. In the vicinity of. And Daryl Probst, uh, gets one of the highest honors by getting an R. He collected some of these and gets the species named after him, Iris Probstii. So Daryl has been, most people are not that aware of Daryl's Iris hybridizing, but if you're into perennials, he's the one that's been producing the masses of new Coreopsis uh, that are available now as perennials from most nurseries. Now, another great hybridizer. Uh, we're going off into the realm of uh, not registered by the American Iris Society, but that, that's never stopped me from putting things in the Iris Encyclopedia. And I try to celebrate all irises. Uh, and I understand uh, Alan McMurtry is with us tonight, so I sort of on edge that I'm going to make a mistake here, but he did something that I think is noteworthy of all the species crosses. He took Iris Danfordi, which he had growing uh, from the trade and Iris Danfordi was sterile and he couldn't cross it with his reticulatas. And he went all the way to Turkey to collect diploid wild Iris Danfordi. So it could be crossed with Iris sophonensis and produce a whole new strain of irises that are just incredible. And the scientific name for them, although I'm not sure it's been officially uh, acknowledged, will be, I'm pretty sure, Iris X McMurtryi. So Alan should get a lot of applause for this and has provided us with some really fantastic irises. Unfortunately, the American Iris Society doesn't uh, register these, so they can't win any of the garden awards. Although they can be shown at a show, 
and win awards in a show, but in the garden, uh, unfortunately, they're not going to be able to uh, do anything unless AIS would change their policy, uh, which I don't see any reason why they shouldn't register them because the, the KAVB, who's in charge of registering, doesn't really bother very much with these until they become commercially available and, and have hundreds of thousands of plants. So for the average iris enthusiast, getting some of these plants from specialty nurseries should be something that the iris society should honor in the way of registering them. Uh, Alan has won the American Iris Society's hybridizers medal and probably the most prestigious award of all is the Foster Memorial plaque uh, that Alan has received. So I, I come all the way from Foster at the beginning back to Foster at the end. And if you want more information about these plants, this is the uh, URL, wikiaris.org main SX about species crosses, or just go to the index on the sidebar and look up under A about species crosses and you can find more information. And just to top it off, these are the irises that have been registered for 2022 that are species crosses. We have 11 that I know of. Oops. Okay, there's the other six. And that does it. So I hope I've inspired everybody to get out there and try to do some species crosses. <laughs>